Hi, I'm Deirdre Gurney. I am the owner and CEO of Gurney Productions. I am uh, Ben O'Dell, president of production for Pantaleon Films, a joint venture between Lionsgate and Televisa. Hi, I'm Devon Franklin, senior vice president of Columbia Pictures. I'm Brian Edwards, I'm the CEO of uh, One Three Media, and I'm also involved with a company called The Lightwork Engineering. Good morning, I'm Charles King, I'm a partner and motion picture agent at William Morris and Depp. Hello, I'm Barbara Fisher, I'm senior vice president of original programming at Up TV. Thanks for coming in and uh, being with us today. Um, I think one of the reasons that we, we started the day with a discussion about the future of this space is because the present is so exciting. Uh, it's been a phenomenal year. I don't know how many of you have had a chance to peruse uh, this week's uh, variety, but we put together a really, really substantial section, and uh, part of it was talking about the tremendous successes of the past year or so, as I think Leslie and, and people in the space know so well, um, the talk about what's going to happen, when is this all going to kind of reach critical mass, everybody knowing that there's this giant audience and kind of uncapped uh, demand, and when is it going to move to the next uh, uh, level? Um, well, we sort of at the next level, and where do we go from here? My, my first question for the panel, um, with great success comes what? What is next? What what uh, what follows on with success? What where is the next logical place um, for this? If we want to call it family entertainment or, or an alternative to something, uh, this space. Where? What do you think is the most important next step or the next thing that we're going to see that is going to help define it or redefine the space? Any thoughts about that? I think, I think for me in the television space, um, Duck Dynasty is our show, and and I think it surprised a lot of people. I think it surprised the networks that a reality show that didn't have tremendous conflict, that had a love and family, um, you know, no train wrecks, um, that it did so well, uh, has paved the way for just a new area, I think, of reality television. Um, and that's that's really exciting to us. And, and I'm going to try to get in your line of sight here. It's a little, we have such a bounty of, uh, of talent that so there's no room for me on the day of service. So. <laughs> um, you know, I think maybe it helps to step back to, to, to one other uh, uh, way of looking at this. Maybe you can help me define what we're talking about. Is, is this uh, family entertainment, uh, faith-based entertainment, is this a market segment? Is it a social movement? Is it something else? How do you internally or in your own minds just define the space you work in? Just uh, casually tell me you know, how you casually think about it or talk about it. Well, you know, I think that these words are very difficult, actually. Yeah, thank um, you. And they're charged with a lot of things and, yes. and mean different things to different people. Right. And, um, we're always trying to find the right words to tell you the truth to mm -hmm. describe our programming. And I and I think at UP, we decided our brand was uplifting television. Mm -hmm. And I think, and also to answer your question before, I think that this kind of television, I think what's becoming known is that it is also entertaining. Because I think all of us up here in, are in the, the world of entertainment. And I think probably the biggest misconception that I get when I'm given um, projects is that here's an uplifting story, it's going to be great for your network. Well, first and foremost, I'm an entertainer. I'm here to get audiences engaged in my show and want to watch the show and stay with the show. And it's not necessarily that every uplifting story should be a series or should be a movie. And, you know, sometimes they're just wonderful people doing wonderful things and we should write about it in the newspaper and we should see it on 2020 or something, but it's not necessarily a show. So there's that misconception. I think the best thing happening right now in this space is that people realize that you can watch something that makes you feel hopeful, that makes you feel happy, that makes you feel inspired, and be entertained at the same time. I do everything in food analogies, so I say you're getting a hot fudge sundae, but you're getting the nutrition of the broccoli without even knowing it. That's pretty funny, though. Thank you for that. Because we're on the same wavelength. One of my questions that I had on my list was, uh, is this spinach? 
Yeah, there you go. And is the is First and foremost, hot fudge Sunday. And then you don't know you're getting the spinach. There you go. In a strange way, as much as uh, I think we talk about entertainment space, in another way, I think we're talking about um, families and the health of families. And so a whole other kind of subtext is almost a health care model or a family support model because families um, are about taking care of kids. It's about educating them. It's about keeping them safe. Uh, it's about giving them purpose and, and centering them. So there's, as you said, there's a lot of stuff um, underneath it. You also, Barbara, you hit on something that I remember talking with people in this space about maybe even five, seven years ago, that there seemed to be a lot of good intentions, there seemed to be great opportunities, but the quality of the entertainment itself seemed to be lagging a bit. Feels like we've kind of blew past that problem in the last five to seven years. Are there um, are there changes in the content itself, or if we talk about the future of the space, are we really talking about the business changes? Where do you think the most profound changes in the space are going to be occurring? Is it some radical different changes in the in the material, in the content itself, or is the change that we're going to see more about how people um, get this stuff. I, I don't know about the, um, the the quality issue is actually one that goes to something we talked about a lot, and just so because a lot of people don't know what one three media is, that's actually Mark Burnett's production company, and then Light Workers is Mark Burnett and Roman Dennis. So he makes Barbara the Voice and Private Shark and Bible 80, Son of God, a bunch of other stuff. We're producing, working with Ben, uh, MGM and Paramount now to produce Ben Hur and some other things in the pipeline. So we're sort of it, it, you know, we look at it as family entertainment, as Mark and Roman saying simply, would you watch it with your kids? Mm -hmm. if, it, if you would watch it with your kids, it's family entertainment. Mm -hmm. It kind of doesn't need to be more, I think, specifically defined than that. Mm -hmm. We always say family and faith like we're embarrassed about the faith part, but we can't say it by itself. Mm -hmm. um, and so we decided, we, Mark and Roma and, 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 and others working with us, decided that, you know, a couple years ago, we're going to make the Bible. We're just going to go right on the nose. Mm -hmm. um, and it had a certain amount of success, and other things have, have been sort of directly in, in the faith space as well. So I think the faith space is a little bit easier to define until you think about it, and it's like, well, is Lone Survivor a movie about faith? Mm -hmm. Is Shawshank Redemption a movie about faith? Mm -hmm. I mean, you make an argument that they are, and I think it's a really good argument. So what you said earlier for me is the changes ought not to be about quality, and what I, fear, what I hope is coming next is more quality, what I fear is coming next is opportunism. Mm -hmm. You know, people less focused on the quality of the output mm -hmm. and more focused on, hey, there's a Christian out there, we can get eight bucks. Mm -hmm. Well, that's going to fail, and it's going to put us right back where we started. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I mean, not to editorialize, but to maybe observe, mm -hmm. I think successes like the Bible and Son of God and Heaven is for Real sort of tick both of the boxes you're talking about. There's a quality level, there's an entertainment level, there's a success level. Is that changing the conversation in Hollywood itself? I mean, here we are. I think we're all talking about an infrastructure <laughs> that sometimes we all feel in whatever part of the entertainment business is this monolithic you know, building that we're all trying to get into. Uh, are the people in that building that are, that are running this town and this entertainment industry, is something changing there in terms of um, to do things like the Bible and have this real, have they moved the discussion to a new place? Thoughts about that? Okay, so I'll speak on that one. Just from sitting in the halls of the agency where we're in the middle of so many <coughs> television projects and features and everything that's being put together, I can tell you that absolutely the conversation is, is taking place. Mm -hmm. The acknowledgement of the strength of the marketplace and the opportunity but also within it, there are definitely a group of people that understand that it's key to have authenticity with the content that's being created, mm -hmm. and the strength of the content, and the quality of the content, mm -hmm. and that you know the moment we, we <laughs> package and put forward content that, that's not authentic, then we will have exactly what, what Brian said, and you'll see a reversal, and then you'll have buyers, and you'll have a marketplace that will be less inclined. So when we think about the future, we recognize and understand the importance of having people involved, whether it's Mark Burnett, or whether it's Joel Olsen, whether it's Bishop T.D. Jakes, that are right there at the center of some of this content that is being made uh, from the beginning through the end, through the marketing phase of it. And I think what you'll see is 
as long as that continues, there will continue to be strength and growth within this marketplace. And, you know, it's exciting to see that, you know, at a place, you know, an agency that may not have been known in the past for understanding this, that there are executives and agents in almost every area of the company mm -hmm. that are interested in cultivating the building. So I think that if that's happening within an agency, then I think you'll definitely start to see that within those traditional studios and the networks as well. I mean, definitely, I mean, it's, it's changing for sure at the studio. I mean, with the four films that you've referenced within the first four months, they've generated, I think, close to $300 million domestically. And so that absolutely is changing the conversation in the studio. I think the challenge is it's still an unknown. I think that when, you know, it's still like, well, how do you do it? And because it's not a traditional space, so to speak, there still is interest, but there's still a lot of curiosity about how do we go to the market um, with integrity, uh, you know, because no one wants to go to the market and have things that don't work. Mm -hmm. And so there's still a question of, well, what works, what doesn't, and there's a lot of mystery in this space. Mm -hmm. But with the success of these films this year, there's absolutely a change in the conversation uh, in, in, internally uh, and externally. I want to get specific on that. Also, I'd love it if somebody could bring me a glass of water. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to make a let me get specific about the business because I think that Rogers and Cowan having uh, Leslie come in and having um, their focus and, and uh, expertise has that been? Oh, thank you. There we go. Has that? Uh, uh, are there companies in town that have developed units? Because I've been either here as a journalist or, or a would-be filmmaker for an awfully long time, and I do notice how agencies, uh, for instance see that there's an opportunity in sports, and suddenly there's a sports unit. Uh, there's an opportunity in brands, and there's a brands unit. There's an opportunity in uh, reality, and there's a reality unit. Uh, are there units being put together at different companies that are focusing, and, and tell us about the ones that, that you're involved in or, or ones that you know about? Well, I, I can just tell you from the agency, we haven't had a conversation about a separate division, but there are people in each area of the company, sort of like an internal focus group that are working across different departments to make sure that the content and, and things that are in the space mm -hmm. are being galvanized and packaged and put together in the right way. So not like a separate unit, but a concerted group of people that are focused on some and interested in this content. That's not the only thing that they're working on, but it's one area of their client base. So everybody's raising, everybody's raising their game across the board. Yes. I mean, I think clearly things are changing. I'm at a network that's devoted its entire network to this kind of program. Mm -hmm. And we're in 70 million homes and growing. So if you're an entire network that, you know, is founded on the basis of having uplifting programming, faith-friendly, family, whatever you want to call it, um, mm -hmm. then clearly times are changing. And clearly it's a business. So I don't think we'd be succeeding and I don't think we'd be growing if there wasn't a huge audience out there asking for this. And I think all kinds of programming can survive. And I think that what's surprising people is this, this kind of programming is for a lot more people than they think. I was reading an interview that Devon had on Heaven is for Real. And I'm not a stalker, I just happen to be reading it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think anything about it. And, um, and you said that you, you know you never target that movie was for anybody. Yes. And that's the home runs. You know, we always use in our network Blindside as the example mm -hmm. because it's sort of in the eye of the beholder. As a Jewish girl, I did not see that as a Christian movie. I'm going to be honest with you, mm -hmm. but I saw it as a uplifting, inspirational, fabulously entertaining true story. And then when I got to Up, everyone said, oh, it's a wonderful Christian movie. I said, really? I didn't know that. <laughs> yes. so, but there's a whole lot of because the, the audience who, want, who, who, who felt that they wanted to see that and identified with that Christian family got something. The audience like me that just wanted to be uplifted and be entertained got something. Mm -hmm. There's your home run. Or having it for real is yeah. that kind of home run, too. And I think that's what we all want to do. I don't think we want to be niche programming. I think we want right. to be programming that that appeals to wide audience. And fam family, by its definition, is not niche. Family Absolutely. is, you know, the whole world. world. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, yes. and for us, as a production company, we we have done family programming mm -hmm. before. It's what our company has done. We're a husband and wife team, and so we understand that world, and that's what we produce. And now, after Ducks, we have dedicated an area of our development department mm -hmm. to it. We're now working on a film and, and have a lot of other 
family value based mm -hmm. programming that that doesn't feel like it is. It just is. It's yeah. just not negative. You know, it's funny when you whenever you have hits the size of uh, of Duck Dynasty, the Bible, Heaven Is for Real, Blindside. Um, it is feels like no one in the world is talking about them as niche or or talking about segments or, or any of this stuff. They're talking about, did you see that movie? Did you watch that show? They're at the water cooler. It's part of the fabric of our culture and it's, it's completely integrated into everything. So it's kind of interesting that we, we're, we're talking here in a segmented way about things that, that the people out in the country are not really segmenting in their minds. Let's talk about Sony for a second because it's interesting to me that there is a, a specialized unit called a firm, and then there is Heaven's for, is for Real, which is something else. Can you tell us how uh, you make decisions around what goes in one pipeline and what goes in the other? Um, yeah, really good question. I mean, Sony uh, Pictures Entertainment has been you know, in the space for, you know, I think, over 10 years now, going back to facing the Giants. And, and the way that it works is, you know, Sony Pictures Entertainment, there are three different divisions. Columbia Pictures, uh, Screen Gems, and then Stage 6. Underneath Stage 6 is where Affirm Pictures is housed. Affirm has been responsible for distributing and releasing Fireproof and uh, Courageous, and most recently Soul Surfer, and they just did Mom's Night Out, and they also are releasing um, The Game Stands Tall, which comes out, I believe, in, in August or September. And they also function as a marketing entity. So on Heaven is for Real, it was a movie that I made uh, through TriStar, which is another division of Sony. And because I work at Columbia Pictures, it was a book that I really loved and felt that it would connect with a wide audience. And so because we had already identified the production of it, uh, a firm was used as part of the marketing entity to help us translate the message um, to the core audience. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's not a clear cut path. I mean, sometimes a firm will do their own picture, sometimes you know, Columbia will do their own pictures, and that's what I love about the space. Is the space is far more broad mm -hmm. than I think uh, we get a credit for. When you just put all those properties together, those are major, you know, Duck Dynasty and the Bible and, you know, um, the Heaven is Real. These are major content that is affecting the culture, mm -hmm. right? That's not, that is crossed over, that's in the mainstream. And there are so many different opportunities for different types of content. And I think at Sony, we've been able to identify there are some pictures that are going to be more targeted, and there are some pictures that are going to be more broad, mm -hmm. and resources from a production standpoint and a marketing standpoint will be allocated appropriately based upon what the content is and based upon who the intended audience is. Mm -hmm. There are some projects that we do that we say, you know, we're just going to go, this is straight core faith-based. Or, you know, when we're going to have this for real, we know we can get core faith-based, but the goal is this book was a big book. It sold over 10 million copies around the world, and it was a mainstream book. So the goal was to make a movie that was at the same level of the book, mm -hmm. which was a story that was resonating with people all around the world. Mm -hmm. So there's no clear-cut, you know, way. Um, a firm does their own thing. Sometimes, you know, again, through Columbia, I do my own thing. It just, but we all won Sony, and we all believe in this space, and we believe in the vibrancy of this space. And I can tell you from Michael Linton and Amy Pascal, who are the chairman, uh, this is something they believe in, they put resources behind, and, you know, coming out of heaven is for real, the question is like, okay, where's the follow-up? You know, like, how do we keep going? How do we keep building? How do we keep the momentum going so that this space can continue yeah, to success, expand? success, uh, there's nothing like success. I always, uh, when I was making my notes for this uh, discussion, my mind went to uh, the Cannes Festival and market where I've been going for about 25 years, and I've always chuckled at how, you know, if there's a, a Rocky movie, there's a Rocky knockoff. <coughs> If there is a Rambo movie, there's a Rambo knock, and all the way back, there's always, you know, in the entertainment industry, people jump on whatever's working and try to replicate it. So I want to go back to a word uh, that you used, uh, sir, uh, authenticity. That's, that's, you know, while we're grappling with words, what, what is the difference between authentic product in this space and inauthentic? There's a great line from um, a movie called Spinal Tap, I think it is, which is, there's a fine line between clever and stupid. <laughs> Nobody knows the answer to that question, I don't think. I mean, something which is designed to a target may look a lot like something which came from a more holistic place. Mm -hmm. um, I wish we could figure that out. I wish yeah. it was all that formulaic. The minute you, you know, when you start forming groups and having pipelines and stuff, I get it from a business operations perspective, but mm -hmm. fundamentally, we're just trying to make content that we think is good, that yeah. people will like, that you know, the decision makers out there has to be appealing to people. 
Now, the notion that there's an audience, there's certainly to some extent a faith audience that we can all acknowledge. Beyond that, it's just an audience. Yes. The same people who are watching the Bible are watching Game of Thrones. Yes. You know, it is the content telling us a, a story that, in yeah. an effective way? Yeah. 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 But I also, but also think, think, yeah. but I also think just like any genre of, of content, whether it's science fiction, drama, comedy, if you bring on some, a filmmaker that is known for thrillers, to direct a broad romantic comedy and they're not authentically connected with the content. So the writer, the filmmaker, the producers, they need to have an affinity yeah, for the content that's being fed. Organic, yeah. honest affinity, yeah. not just seeing the opportunity. So when we reference a movie like Heaven is for Real, Randall Wallace, he's Christian. Everyone knows he's a strong person of faith. He was authentically connected to the material. Right. And you had a producer, Joe Roth, who's incredible with executing. You have a producer, T.D. Jakes, who's been great at executing, but he also understands the marketplace. And all of those elements together, along with the executive, Devon, who understands the market and a consistent track record with the studio that knows how to market to them, yeah. all of those things work together in concert for that to be successful. Yeah. So you have to have the right elements. Yeah. And, it, and they have to organically, authentically work. Yeah. So and I agree completely with what Brian's saying. There's no exact uh, sort of definition on how you do that. But you that's, can tell. that's, that's mm -hmm. one example. Yeah. So I, I do agree. Credibility is yeah. really, is really, really key. And it's important um, to have people that are involved with the project that do have credibility. Mm -hmm. and, and I think as authentic as you can be has to come from a place of what, where your heart is. You know, it's one thing to want to make money, and we all, you know, are in a business. There's no question about that. Mm -hmm. But it's the content we're creating coming from a genuine place. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, there's no fine way to define that. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, it requires studios, producers, everyone involved to say, are we re if we're not really doing this because somebody here believes in this movie, mm -hmm. then the chances that it will fail are monumental. Mm -hmm. Especially because consumers in the marketplace, they know when something they isn't. They know, they do yeah. know. You I, yeah, I want to pick up on that too. You have come. Yeah, I think, it, just to what Devon is saying, I think the authenticity and the credibility all go to our belief and passion in the project. And there, it's timing. There's a time right now. I know Mark, and I know some of the projects you guys are probably making now are things he wanted to do, but the time is right now. For the, for the film project we have, I heard this story seven years ago, and I was so moved by a woman telling me a story, and I wanted to make it, but, you know, the time wasn't there. And now it's, everyone's open to it. It can go mainstream, it can go broad, but their projects were passionate about, like Heaven is for Real. The book was a huge success. You would have made it even if this weren't happening in the marketplace right, right now. Right. But you made it the right way. Yeah. Let's uh, uh, jump over for one second. We were talking about segments. Um, uh, the Spanish language and Spanish culture uh, segment of this, how is it similar and how is it different? Um, yeah, I was trying to figure out how to jump in, but there's so much content. <laughs> you know, uh, I think it's been a really great couple of years for the Latino market because, you know, first they've been credited to some degree with electing our president, and it was so important to get them to uh, come out and vote. And now we just heard the, uh, the uh, president of the National Theater Organization say that the Hispanic market is the most important segment that they have to go after. But whenever I hear these things, I would say, well, what segment of that niche are we talking about? Mm -hmm. And we specifically focus on mostly Spanish language uh, because it's a very contained uh, environment. And what's very interesting is that we don't really go out specifically looking for family entertainment. Uh, it's just that they travel in families. And in fact, when you look at the, the genres that they most resonate with, family is not that high up on the list. Mm -hmm. um, but they'll go see a horror movie together. I mean, you'll see a family of five Latinos in, a, in the front row of salt. You know? mm -hmm. So it's a very interesting, which, which speaks a little bit to Brian's point, which is it's really one of those movies that bring the family out. Um, that said, you know, when we start talking about faith, it's a conversation we've started to have. It's obviously, I'm married to a Colombian woman. She's very uh, Catholic. And you know she's very aware of all these movies, and she's bilingual. And she goes and sees them, and 
you know, the question becomes, if we make one in Spanish, is that going to really become a business for us? And yes. we're just beginning to explore it. It's really unknown to us because we're working in such a small niche as it. And, and, you know, the more uh, that we uh, go into any of your, your companies and your, your uh, development and, and the, the teams and the processes, you, you, you do start to find that, that this is an infinitely complex subject that we kind of pull together uh, out of convenience, but uh, uh, between evangelical and Catholic, Spanish-speaking, English-speaking, <laughs> different demographics, it, it's not one size fits all by any means. Uh, that, that's correct, and so when you look at the way construction is not included, which is a film that has crossed $100 million worldwide, mostly in the U.S. and Mexico, um, it's a film that was very family oriented. At the same time, you know, it doesn't fit a mold. It, there was nobody there saying, oh, you can't say this. There was some risque kind of double entendres in the film and so forth, but it never sort of uh, turned anyone off. And the messaging was ultimately so important. And I think, you know, the value system uh, is really what we look for in all our films, and that's the thing that triggers uh, our audience to go out and see. You know, one of the things that I find uh, <coughs> fascinating, mysterious, uh, complex, um, is the marketing of any uh, motion picture, any entertainment today, because the marketing costs around movies are just so staggeringly high. They push a lot of movies. You, you can make a movie very inexpensively, and a really high quality movie inexpensively, but you probably are not going to be able to market it inexpensively. I'm told that this segment, certainly the family film segment, the marketing costs are even higher. So when someone says the audience knows that this is coming out, I was fascinated this week to see Fall in the Stars. How did everybody know that Fall in the Stars was going to be the movie? We know that it was a bestseller. My daughter read the book. I know that. But there are lots of bestsellers that don't translate into that kind of opening weekend. So my question would be, if we talk about the future of family entertainment, is social media changing this for the better? Uh, it, what is changing to make the marketing of this stuff um, work more efficiently or less uh, cost prohibitively? Any, anything changes? Or, or tell me how the audience does know to see Heaven is for Real outside of the fact that the book was a success. I mean, part of it is, you know, with any prop, so you just mentioned Fall of Our Stars and uh, Heaven is for Real, with both which were books. Mm -hmm. So number one thing is you go after the book readers mm -hmm. and you make sure that they're aware of the movie, that they're engaging with content from the film. So you market to them. But then my question would be, how do you target them? And social media is, is huge because you know, there are communities that have already been formed based around discussing the content of the book, of these books, and, and the impact. And with Heaven is For Real, because the story had a kind of um, a, a emotional, cathartic experience for people who were engaging with the story, I mean, we put up our Facebook page, and every week, the number of people that would like it and that would engage with the content far surpassed the original projections because people were sharing stories of how they lost loved ones and how the, this story affected them and how they shared the book with one of their family members and it brought them hope. The story went beyond just being entertainment. Mm -hmm. and, and in a social media community, especially Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, we saw tremendous, tremendous growth because the more that a story affects your life, the more you want to continue to engage with it. And I think, you know, with the same thing with Baltimore Stars, it was like people love that story and that trailer was amazing. And trailer was really big for us too. I mean, cutting a great trailer for Heaven is Real. Our marketing department, you know, Lauren Schwartz and those guys did a phenomenal job. So when you saw that trailer, people who didn't even know about the book loved it. And then those who saw it, had read the book, they were like, we gotta see that. But social media is key because one, the cost is very low. And two, you can continue to engage with an audience where your media spend in terms of television is a lot more costly. So you have to be very specific and targeted on how you do that. The social media, you can engage with your audience 24 seven. Mm -hmm. And the more you post and the more you share, the more they like it, the more they share. And you're able to build wide awareness for a property even before you begin to get into your mainstream media spend. 
I think some of it is also what Charles said. When you get certain people involved in a project, there's a trust in them. I think a lot of people now think that if Mark Burnett and Roma Downey put their name to it, that they have vetted it, that they wouldn't be associated with it if it wasn't quality, if it wasn't authentic, Bishop Jakes, whoever it is. Yes. Um, and I think as a network, we're trying to be trusted as an entire network. Mm -hmm. And we may not have the highest ratings, and we may not have the biggest um, programming budget, but we have ranked highest in trust. Mm -hmm. And that's that's a big deal because, and, and you have to honor that with your audience, and you have to make sure that once they see you're associated with it, I think it takes off. Mm -hmm. And there are certain people that have engendered that trust. I, I want to pick up on that, that idea of certain people because um, in the old, old days of Hollywood, uh, there was a star system, and the stars drove the whole thing. And in the last uh, 20, 30 years, the uh, franchises appear to be driving the boat, certainly for theatrical. Who are the stars of the space today, and, and could you mention any stars that may be emerging? <laughs> well, <laughs> it depends on us. Yeah, I'm not sure why they're laughing, but I am curious. <laughs> but that's part of the question is to find a star and sort of which aspect of the business are you talking about. I don't know. I, like like I don't know. I, I mean, we know that Roma and Mark are stars. They're right. stars in the space, in my view. So that's my definition of star is who are, you could also call them. Uh, franchise drivers or brand names or, or, or people of trust or the, the community of trust. But the, you know, who, who is it that when the audience looks, they say, I want to go see that film or that I want to know more about that TV show or that product because of the association with this person? You know, there's certainly going to be a, a variety of faith leaders that have mm -hmm. incredibly wide awareness. We mentioned the here today, Bishop Jakes, mm -hmm. uh, Joel Osteen, Rick Warren, mm -hmm. for example, and there's many others. I don't mean mm -hmm. to leave anybody out yeah. uh, on purpose. This list is probably too long. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, uh, behind, in front of the camera, I don't, I, yeah. you know. I, I, mean, I mean both in front and behind, and, and maybe a star is someone who endorses something. I mean, I think you also, I think there also be, you know, you know, they, they mentioned uh, Bishop Jakes, Joel Osteen, Rick Warren, but then there's been the consistency of Tyler Perry in the faith marketplace mm -hmm. and what family marketplace will be faith themed in, in mm -hmm. a number of his movies. Mm -hmm. uh, you have people that are aspirational, inspirational, like Old Laura, unless she's still with the own network, mm -hmm. honestly, what she did with her, her show for years. I think that, you know, the success of God's not dead, I think, when they market their next group of movies, from the producers of, from the creators of, from right. the, Director of Guys Not Dead, I think that'd be incredibly valuable. I think that Randall Wallace, obviously, with the success. I also think that you, you mentioned the Blind Side and uh, the, you know how well that movie worked. And I think that Alcon, yeah. as a company, have been able to brand themselves as a company. And they, we, with the, I think they've, they've done several films that cater to a family uh, audience <coughs> after the success of Blind Side, and most of those have been successful as well. So, you know. You, have, you clearly have your massive brands like Disney, which, which are catered to, to a family audience. So I think that you know there's an emerging group, and I think there'll be more. But there are those examples that, that, that we just touched on. And I think you you mentioned someone I didn't hear from you. It's like this: Are you not like you're always the same kind of thing? Uh, yeah. Yeah. But we, I mean, that's a terrific example. And that's the thing. There's there's a lot of but the best news is is that you know family entertainment's been around for a long time. It's going to be around for a long time. There are businesses like Pixar, and DreamWorks Animation, they're essentially devoted solely to it. Mm -hmm. What's interesting about the faith half of your plus sign there is really for me right now, and for us, I think for everybody here is it's just not off limits anymore. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. And people who aspire to do it can see that there's a path to business success, there's a path to personal spiritual success. Mm -hmm. So you know, as more people do it, this stuff I think the stars are yet to come. I mean there's a few people like Tyler Perry who've been doing it a long time at an incredibly high level. Yeah. But as we do more and more and more of that, you're gonna see more of it and hopefully over time it will not it won't it, you won't even have, it won't even be a faith based summit anymore. I don't mean to kill your summit, but honestly, it just, just be the regular thing. But yeah, this is part of the conversation. That'll be the win. Yeah. Let's. Uh, let's. Did you have another comment on that? I was just going to add that you know Corey and Lily Robertson were in God Is Not Dead for a very short period of time, a couple minutes, and but they were really smart in marketing that film. I think almost you would know better than me, but almost exclusively through social media. I didn't see commercials. Yes. 
But Corey and Willie were in that. They had that trust. Um, people knew it was going to be a family film by seeing them in it, and they were endorsing it by being a part of it. And absolutely, yeah. exactly. Um, one, one, last, uh, one last business oriented question. I'm going to open this up so the folks out there have some questions to be uh, thinking of them and be ready to ask them. Um, one of the toughest things that's happened to the, uh, the film business is the demise of physical media. Uh, the, uh, the, the video sales, which used to be that way you got healthy uh, because you, you might break even on theatrical and then you had home entertainment to save you. <coughs> Um, are there changes in the business right now that are presenting challenges to this segment or changes that are wind in the sails of the segment? Any, anything in the mark, in the general uh, kind of macro economics or the, or the structure of the business today that you feel is on your side and, and helping or things that make what you're doing that makes more difficult than the market realities. And, and, and I mean, I think the good news is is that you know I think change for the better because there is momentum. Um, the the quality is continuing to improve, and that you know when it comes to looking at it as a business, in order to tap an audience that will show up because they want more content that's inspirational, you know when you look at how much you have to spend to engage that audience, it's really about the content, and if the content is there. The cost to market to that audience uh, is, I would argue, probably a lot less okay. than you look at other genres in order to get people really excited. So I think from that so there's something sticky about it. Absolutely, that the, the, yeah. the connection is on your side. Absolutely, and I think that, from a business standpoint, is good mm -hmm. because you can actually make more content and reach an audience <laughs> where the barrier to entry, maybe for other genres, maybe a little high mm -hmm. from a marketing standpoint. Gotcha. Yeah, I think there's a, that's exactly right, um, Devin. There's a much greater efficiency in certain areas, and I think this is one of them. Just as a quick aside in, in, to what Ben was saying earlier, you know, when, when we did Son of God, we learned, I, I was a dream for a long time, so I sort of knew this, but I really didn't, and it was interesting. We, we were talking about the, the, the Spanish language market and the release of the Spanish dub of the movie, and I learned that there are typically only 10 to 15 theaters in America that will publish times for Spanish showtimes meaning they'll advertise it in advance as in Spanish, because obviously if you're not a Spanish speaker and you see a Spanish showtime, you probably won't see the movie, right? So, and this is like the norm, that's the way, and that would be very interesting. So we worked very closely with Fox, great distribution and marketing partners all the way through. I think we ended up with over 400 theaters publishing Spanish, showtimes in Spanish, and I think, if I remember correctly, the, the well, I don't want to get into, I can't remember the specific percentage, but the percentage of box office results from the primarily Spanish language print was phenomenally high, mm -hmm. like multiples higher than the norm. Mm -hmm. And there's an example of just, we, we had a really good marketing partner in a company called Arenas that helped us work with that group. Fox was really smart about it. And, you know, we did things that were done in Spanish and worked with Sam Rodriguez, another person, for example, in the face So there's attention paid to it. And simply paying attention yeah. provided this great return mm -hmm. without necessarily having to throw just truckloads of cash or yeah. something. So all of this going back to the authenticity question, if you think if you if you're planning in advance and you're coming from the right place and you pay attention, mm -hmm. you know, I think everybody here can see there's great results. We look at this panel, but we all kind of like the same stuff and yeah. we, we respond to it because it feels like it's real. Yeah, it's a great I, I, I think the phrase paying attention, it sounds deceptively simple, but um, the one thing that gets Hollywood and uh, Hollywood is you know, the entertainment business to pay attention is success. And so we're uh, we're here uh, celebrating that. Um, I hope we have time for some questions. I don't know where my timer is. So, you have a question there? No. Yeah. I don't think we have mics, so I think we're going to shout. Well, I'm kind of dating myself here, but uh, back in the '70s, I worked with companies that produced family films like Where the Red Fern Grows and mm -hmm. uh, Seven Alone, uh, Grizzly Adams TV series, Greatest Heroes of the Bible which were successful even back then. Right. So what would be the difference now in the, in the new paradigm that we have versus back then? What do you think has changed uh, sort of systematically or content-wise from uh, the family's success in the leader side? Well, I think just content-wise, people are wanting it again. 
I think we went through a, a drought where it wasn't that people didn't want it, but I'm not sure that the programmers were listening. I mean, as we always say, there's a huge country out there between LA and New York. And uh, I'm from Ohio, I know it. And, uh, and, and really, I think that part of the country has always said there's nothing on TV for us. And there was, you know, and you know, we have a lot of those old series on our network and we have Touched by an Angel and we have Seventh Heaven and people go, where's the next one, where's the next one? And you were probably operating at a time when that was a successful genre. And then we went through a drought, and I think that drought is over. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody's recognizing, every network, every studio is now recognizing that, that you were onto something. <laughs> and uh, we shouldn't have stopped because there's a, you know, and, and, and I think as Brian said, it doesn't mean you can't have Breaking Bad, and you can't have great shows like Game of Thrones. It doesn't mean that one has to X out the other. It's about having diversity and about having a lot of things out there for a lot of different people. So uh, choices. Yeah. yeah, choices. I think the, uh, the, but also when you speak of diversity, I mean, Tyler Perry tapped into an audience that no one knew existed and we're doing it again now. The other thing that's changed greatly is the demographics, who's consuming, or, or the awareness of who's consuming or who wants it. And I think that's been an enormous part of this family and faith conversation. It's going to continue to grow in all these niches as well. Well, it's uh, it's great to be uh, to be here this morning at this uh, at this exciting moment and to have such a great panel to start the day off. And I sure appreciate you all coming and all of you. And uh, on to the next one. Thank you.